This week on Quality, <laughs> this week, <laughs> Good this job, week Greg. on Quality Digest Live, <laughs> can outsourced jobs be brought back to the United States? That's right. Plus, we investigate the transition to AS9100 or Vision D with Chad Keimel of Omnex. That and more when we come back. When we come back. <laughs> Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for June 3rd, 2016. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. That he is, and I'm Quality Digest publisher Mike Richmond. I'm glad you got that, those nerves out of the way, <laughs> Dirk. We've only done 300 yeah, shows, yeah, so I'm sure you, you're nervous, I understand it. All right, for many, productivity is the truest measure of improved quality and efficiency. So it was with a great deal of interest that we read about the Conference Board's recent study, Navigating the New Digital Economy, Driving Digital Growth and Productivity from Installation to Deployment. We linked out to an article describing the report in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. The crux of the report is that the new digital economy, which the authors characterize as rapidly increasing spending on cloud computing, data analysis, and services springing from always on internet connections, has not yet been fully deployed in those organizations that have embraced it. This, even as the pace of installations of such systems continues to grow. It's for this reason, despite accelerating innovation within information and communication technology, which can be considered ICT as the acronym that they use, uh, increases in ICT spending and price declines for these products and services, the new digital economy really hasn't greatly affected productivity, profitability, or overall economic growth. The report finds that the top half of industries which represent the most intensive users of ICT account for 60% of the slowdown in labor productivity growth wow. in the United States since 2007, as well as 54% in the UK and 66% in Germany over the same time. So these companies that are heavily into ICT are the ones that are accounting for a lot of the slowdown in productivity. So the question is, why? And that's what the report intends to answer. Well, the report actually points at some metrics that, that might help to explain uh, what's underpinning this a little bit. Firstly, the relative price of ICT has declined by almost 10% overall, with prices for ITT, ICT services in particular falling by as much as 30%. Largely as a result of these savings, productivity growth in the U.S. is understated by about 0.3%. Labor shortages are also hobbling industry. It's especially difficult to find research analysts and data scientists, and even the market for programmers and developers has tightened significantly. The report recommends that those who want to leverage ICT for improved productivity should take advantage of price declines and make additional investments. Uh, specifically, this can be done by shifting from ICT assets to digital services for increased flexibility, agility, and resiliency. In turn, that should lead to the ability to create more innovative products and services and bring them to market a lot faster. The report also advises organizations to leverage so-called local innovation ecosystems to better access talent, partnership, and shared services. So, interesting report here by, by the conference board, I think. And, and, and of course, if you want to find out more and maybe order the report, uh, Navigating the New D Digital Economy, Driving Digital Growth and Productivity from Installation to Deployment, uh, be sure to check out the story link right below the video player screen. I, and I think, I mean, to put a, a fine point on this, I mean, what they're saying here is that pro, the productivity losses, quote unquote, are, are like paper losses. They aren't real losses of productivity because the savings that they're getting from these reduced costs aren't being factored in. They're not being reinvested is the key thing. They're being pocketed as savings, which doesn't really affect productivity. And that's well, all well and good for those organizations, but it doesn't improve productivity in the US or the UK. Well, I got a little confused about uh, part of what you're saying. So they're saying that the companies are actually the physically less productive or, or, or the, the measure of productivity, which is a complicated economic measure, is, is showing that productivity has slowed slightly. But what's going on with regard to ICT is that is that the savings are there. The money's there, but it's not being reinvested is what they're saying. Okay. Okay. The, the, what was budgeted for these, these, these systems, it, the costs are actually turning out to be much lower and services are a great deal lower, but money's not being reinvested. So the report mm -hmm. recommends that there should be, you know, flexibility added to these systems to take advantage of that and to, you know, try to increase productivity by maybe adding 
some, some additional uh, products or services to their mix. So that's, that's kind of what's inferred by the report. It's a little bit of a, as many times in these reports, kind of crosswinds, and it's hard to kind of interpret what they're saying here, but that's really the, the crux of this idea is that their savings that aren't being realized are pretty much being pocketed and not being reinvested, and that way maybe the productivity could be increased if it were okay. to be reinvested. All right. Uh, well, there was another interesting uh, story this week in Quality Digest. Uh, it was a science technology mm -hmm. story, and it was about how 3D printing, my favorite topic, is yep. helping to reconstruct dinosaur skeletons. So cool that's stuff. pretty cool. So a little background uh, on this story first. There is a place in Alaska called the Liscombe Bone Bed, and it's the single richest bed for dinosaur bones in either polar region, which is great, right? I mean. Uh, uh, it's it's got lots of bones and mm -hmm. it's also not so great because there's lots of bones um, <laughs> it's a three foot yeah. thick layer of bones and I guess it's it's from what I've understood is when you're when archaeologists are, are, are yeah uh, are digging through all mm -hmm. this stuff they're just they find bone after bone I right. mean it is really rich in bones the problem is that in they're in no particular order, although scientists do believe that the bones all belong to the same species. So what they're saying is they're not finding complete skeletons, they're finding just bones. bones right? Individual bones. Now according to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Pat uh, Druckenmiller, uh, museum curator of earth science and associate professor of geology at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, quote, there are thousands of bones in the Liscombe bone bed on the north slope. Most seem to be from the same species, says Druckenmiller, but many of the bones are mixed up and disarticulated, which means getting an exact matching left and right bone for a leg or the skulls is virtually impossible, and matching left and right uh, bone parts is important yeah, if you sure. want to reconstruct a skeleton, That's which right. is basically what you know, Druckenmiller is trying to do. Mm -hmm. So here's the problem. So you're in this bone bed, and you've got all these bones. So you pick up, you pick up a left, you know, a left <laughs> leg bone, yeah, whatever, yeah. <laughs> left knee bone, yeah. um, and now you've got to find a right knee bone. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you find a right knee bone, but it's from a different animal. So maybe this one's big and this one's small, and so getting them to match doesn't really doesn't really work. And so mm -hmm. when they're trying to build a skeleton. Uh, they're forced to kind of, if they're going to make a, a skeleton that looks symmetrical, mm -hmm. they're forced to having to kind of construct the other, the other half, mm -hmm. or be lucky enough to find a bone that's the left and right matching bones that, that are, are uh, approximately the same size, mm -hmm. right? So there is a way around this, and what happened is Druckenmiller employed the help of Michael Holland Productions in Bozeman, Montana. This is a company, Holland's company, is one that specializes in creating building natural history exhibit features. So here was where 3D comes in. This is what Holland did. Um, when these bones are made, first of all, usually when they build a, 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 a skeleton, mm -hmm. it's not made from the real bones. Very often what they do is they'll take a plaster cast, mm -hmm. make a plaster cast of the bone, and so it's actually, the skeletons very often are built up of casts of the actual bones, and that's what they do in this case. So they would, they would make a plaster cast of one of the bones, let's say the left left hand side, and then they would scan that cast using a, a Geomagic Capture 3D scanner, which is a little uh, uh, desktop scanner. Mm -hmm. They bring these uh, this point cloud image into Geomagic Wrap, which is a, a software, to finalize the scans and create mirror images, and then output that in a file format that is suitable for 3D printing. And then finally, they would 3D print the matching part uh, in gypsum using a ProJet uh, 60, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, ProJet 660. And you can see on the screen here what mm -hmm. we see is kind of the, the white parts are the 3D printed parts and the grayish parts there are the plaster casts. Yeah, they look pretty good. And yeah, basically what that is, yeah. you're, you're seeing the white parts are literally 3D printed images mm -hmm. of the part uh, on the other side, That's right. right? So they're, they're just simply mirror images of an existing part. So then Holland took all these parts, uh, the 3D printed parts, painted them, varnished them, and then assembled the final skeleton using uh, the combination of both the plaster casts and the printed parts. So that the, and also everything's painted so it, you know, and, and so forth, so it looks, so it all looks the same. In fact, I think we have, yeah, there's yeah. a completed skeleton right oh, there. Cool. So you can see it's been painted and, and so forth, so it doesn't, you're not seeing these gray parts and white parts, it all looks very cohesive. Um, but this is really a great, uh, a great tool, and we, we look at it here, let's say, in an in a archaeology mm -hmm. kind of sense, and you think, oh, gee whiz, that, that's really very cool. 
Um, but 3D printing is, is working its way, including this mirroring, in other applications mm -hmm. as well. Uh, vintage car, mm -hmm. manu uh, vintage car uh, collectors sure. very often may not be able to find, and a show I was watching the other day, couldn't find, I think it was a, a, a bezel for something or on the left-hand side of the car, just never could find one yeah. for the right-hand side. So they basically did that. They yeah. scanned it, created a mirror image, 3D printed it. By the time it's all painted up, Nobody knows Nobody the difference, but it was either that or have nothing, yeah. right? And it was a comp, you know, these cars, you know, all complex curves, so it'd mm -hmm. be hard to, or easier, I should say, to 3D print it than right. it would be to to fabricate it. Yeah, yeah. good so stuff. So pr pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, dinosaurs and 3D printing. I mean, that's that's as good It'd as get it gets right there. Get much better than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks, Derek. All right, get all your right. geek on. That's yeah. right. All right, presidential candidates want to bring back millions of outsourced jobs is a statement, and it's also the compelling name of an article by Stephen Manning and Marcus Larson that ran in Tuesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Well, dear viewer, we're entering the summer of 2016, so buckle up your seatbelts. Now begins the most entertaining or perhaps the most revolting part of the election year. When the primaries end, the conventions convene, and the major candidates start slinging mud for all they're worth. I like to call it uh, rhetoric season, or if you prefer, Dirk, something that rhymes with full spit season. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's what it's all yeah, about. Full well, spit. be that as it may, and all kidding aside, the issue that authors Manning and Larson raise here is an important, and it's one that major party candidates like Bernie Sanders, of course, Donald Trump, and Hillary Clinton have all referenced on several occasions during their respective campaigns. That, of course, is the meaning of outsourcing within the framework of the broader U.S. economy and the manufacturing sector, of course, specifically. Each of these candidates believes that the outsourcing of U.S. manufacturing jobs is a bad thing and that it needs to be reversed. Much of that blame has been laid at the feet of free trade deals like NAFTA. Uh, their solutions include lower corporate taxes, improving worker skills, and or rebuilding infrastructure. Now, any or all of those things might prove effective in luring some manufacturing jobs back to the United States, and there's research from the Reshoring Initiative, for example, that shows that some jobs are indeed coming back. After all, the United States has several advantages here, not the least of which is that many folks would rather work and live in, say, Tennessee uh, than perhaps in Guangdong, China. Uh, the fact that wages are rising quickly for manufacturing workers in many parts of Asia is a factor supporting U.S. reshoring as well. So our scattered quality problems and various delays associated with issues of distance or language. But here, Dirk, is the key argument within that that these authors are making, and it's really, I think, a strong one. It's the fact that today's vast multinational corporations have an almost Darwinian impulse to survive and find solutions to problems. Nimbleness and creativity are embedded in their DNAs. And what that means is that when hidden costs or unforeseen problems emerge, these companies generally don't just pull up stakes and leave facilities that they've established overseas. They find innovative ways to address the problems there on site. As problems emerge, solutions are found. As costs rise, savings are uncovered. After all, these companies entered into working agreements for these, with these particular nations for very logical reasons, some of which revolve around costs, but others which have to do with things like access to markets or the cultural benefits of different management and worker viewpoints. Now, tax breaks, infrastructure upgrades, and a better trained workforce are all potentially excellent ideas to encourage companies to stay put here in the United States or to return if jobs have been outsourced in the past. I mean, who knows? We may even see more and more foreign companies bringing jobs, including manufacturing jobs, to the United States. It's happened. It might happen more. But the research that Manning and Larson have done offers a, a broader and potentially more sustainable way for the U.S.-based workforce to benefit from the complex and interconnected business world of tomorrow. Some of that has to do with emerging technologies such as robot, robotics or genomics uh, and 3D printing. Uh, close training and ongoing professional developments in these fields uh, will certainly give U.S. workers a leg up on the rest of the world as these sectors come to a full flower in the coming years and decades. But beyond training, there's a certain attitude adjustment that's recommended here as well. A lot of it, perhaps the vast majority of it, comes down to personal skills, the ability to lead and mentor, to, to understand cultural differences and human similarities, to ask the right questions at the right time, and, and to not only hear truth, but to act on it. Future U.S. workers, future U.S. managers are going to need all those soft skills in addition to a, a heaping helping of technical know-how to succeed in tomorrow's economy. So we started this piece with politics humorously, maybe, hopefully, I think. Uh, but in all seriousness, I feel that the greatest thing that America has going for it is an open, fair, 
an honest culture, and that spans our political system, our economic system, and our social system, you name it. Is it perfect? Nope, not even close, <laughs> not even close. But the ideals of this country are special, I think, and the intentions of the people who live here, work here, and govern here are, in my opinion, just. As long as that doesn't change, and as long as we continue to recognize that welcoming newcomers to our country and giving them real opportunities is an important part of what made this country great in the first place, then I think that the United States is well positioned for economic success on the world stage for many, many years to come. And I, I really believe that. I think that's, that's the core of this issue, I think, in many cases, is this idea of, of what kind of a country do we want to be. And if we want to be the country that our ideals say that we want to be, then the United States is going to be fine in the world economy going forward because people are going to want to be here. Right. And if they want to be here, we've got to welcome them here because, you know, this country, of course, was founded on immigrants. And I mean, immigrants come here and they start companies and they add a lot of richness to the culture. And, and we need to embrace that. I think that's, to me, the surest way to ensure that the United States is going to continue to lead the uh, world economy going forward. Right. Um, and, and the the reshoring. Tell us a little bit about the reshoring in, uh, initiative. Mm, Harry Moser, yeah, 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 Harry Moser's initiative, okay. and, and that's that's a group that really has studied this question very closely. Is what the true costs of out, outsourcing are, and and that's really their their key their key argument is that there's a lot of hidden costs that companies don't account for when they outsource jobs. They right. say, especially in the past, they say, well, you know, heck, a worker in China will do the job for half the, the cost of a worker in the U.S., so obviously then we need to move the jobs there, but there's a lot of hidden costs that go into issues, that. Quality uh, issues, Quality issues, shipping, and, language yeah. problems, miscommunications. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, the idea is that those things are arguments to bring jobs back or keep them here, but, you know, again, as these authors argue, counter-argue to that, well, nimble, smart companies are going to find ways to overcome those hurdles and be better at it as they go forward. They went to those countries for good reasons, and rather than try to fight against that, the better idea is right. to see how America and American workers at a, at a higher level can succeed in the coming world economy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Be, becoming an, an attractive an attractive spot. Attractive to, yeah. and, and to have the workforce, yeah. again, the management force that can lead and do all those soft yeah. skill things that are so important. Yeah, it's like most things. You can't, you can't legislate <laughs> reshoring. I mean, you, you people got to want to have th their work done here. We got to want to have our, yeah. our work done here. For, like you said, uh, companies outside the country yeah. got to want to bring work here. Yeah, it's uh, and it's going to take care of itself if you if you provide uh, a, 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 a culture and a location and a workforce that will that will be attractive. I agree. Yep, yep. Okay. exactly right. All right. Well, um, let's talk about aerospace. Mm -hmm. AS ninety one hundred revision D will most likely be released, uh, released in October 2016, we think, maybe? <laughs> we'll find out a little bit. Uh, uh, a little bit later, actually, than was, was, was expected. Um, and as anticipated, it borrows from or is aligned with ISO 9001 2015, the new release of ISO 9001. And if you work in the aerospace industry, you might be curious as to what is in RevD of AS9100. Well, that was the topic of one of our stories this week, Changes and Implementation Strategies for AS9100 Revision D by Chad Keimel. And wouldn't you just know it, Chad is with us on the show today to talk a bit about what some of these changes will mean for those currently holding AS9100 certificates. Hi, Chad. Hi, Dirk. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? Great. Uh, well, let, let's get <laughs> let's get the, uh, the release date kind of figured out somewhat maybe. Uh, we had expected uh, AS 9100, uh, 9100 to be released in April and then we were thinking May and now we're not sure when the release date is. Can you tell us when the release date is? Yeah, you know, Dirk, the standard is ready. It's ready to be, you know, launched. However, the international, you know, the different countries in the world who are all members of IAQG felt it was unfair for the English version to come out so much sooner than the translated international versions that everybody's agreed to hold it off till about earliest we could expect it is probably mid-September, latest is beginning of October. So that's, that's the sort of the launch date now that's being replanned. So Chad, this is Mike. Let me let me ask this question for you. What what is the biggest change between AS ninety one hundred revision C and AS ninety one hundred revision D? Great, great question, Mike. Mike, I, I'd succinctly put it as three major things. The first one, I'll just say it like this: it's uh, product safety, counterfeit parts, and uh, human factors coming in to the AS ninety one hundred D 
which is as a delta. But really, the big stories are, you know, there's a number of, there's about 15 different standards that the AS9100 suggests that we integrate back as we implement AS9100D and to different clauses that really could use it. However, it's not mandated, it's recommended. The one Omnex would really like to recommend to everyone is the Aerospace APQP and PPAP. It is really being pushed by most of the OEMs and large tier ones and would behoove everyone to take a look at that AS9145 standard and implement that, you know, just we have been helping a number of different organizations right now. Actually, since since about 2000, well, about six, seven years, we've been helping companies, uh, you know, imp implement this, and now it has become a standard. And what about and risk the third, of course, what about risk sorry about that, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what about risk-based thinking? Is, is risk-based uh, thinking, you know, which obviously was, was so prevalent and kind of the big thing in, in uh, ISO 9001-2015, is that uh, working its way into RevD is of AS9100? You know, this is the, if you look at AS9100C, it always had risk in it, but it was product realization risk, and I know for the longest time, the the aerospace folks thought they already had risk in it. So, you know, sometime last year, the realization came in that yes, there is a big delta with risk-based thinking, and things like 6.1, which is planning risk, is not there in AS9100 before this. So, you know, the third point I'd, I'll make I'll make from the, the deltas, the big change, of course, is a high-level structure and risk-based thinking. So, you know, the interested party expectations, context, you know, risk-based thinking, planning and risk, planning, you know, risk and customer satisfaction, huge deltas, all of which will have to be, you know, handled by the aerospace companies. Okay, and is there going to be some sort of uh, training available for aerospace companies to, to understand what uh, these differences are and, and how to implement them? So, and in, in you can expect third-party auditors to get trained you know, when the standard gets launched in um, October or September, there will be third-party auditors getting trained. Omnix is starting to train people right now. You can call it a FDIS, or it's actually the balloted standard, we, you know, which I said is, you know, in English. We're already starting to launch that training and also AS9145 training globally, you know, um, Europe, USA, Asia, to help aerospace companies you know, get there as fast as they can because the transition deadlines are looming. Oh, and what are what are some of these what are some of these key dates? You know, in, in both these cases, I'll tell you more about you know the deltas in the webinar we're doing next week, and also the dates. I'll just succinctly put in that the dates are the same as the ISO 9001 2015 dates. That's really why you know you're seeing instead of a three-year deadline, suddenly we have a two-year deadline, and the deadline by which you cannot audit AS9100C uh, anymore is also right around the corner, also following the ISO 9001 deadline. So uh, are, are, those, are, are those dates easy to find? Uh, I mean, I'm assuming they could just look yeah. up uh, dates on I ISO 9001. I don't have it readily handy right now, but I'll share that in the webinar. Okay, yep. And by the way, just uh, uh, the webinar uh, Chad's talking about is uh, next week we have a webinar, myself and Chad. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Changes and Implementation Strategies for AS9100 Revision D, and uh, that's actually uh, next Tuesday, June 7th, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And uh, actually, why don't you just give us a, a brief overview of what you're going to cover in that um, in that webinar, Chad? So definitely, I'm going to go in detail, talk about you know all the additional requirements that were in AS9100C from ISO 9001, where they moved to in this standard. Where are the, how are the shells dispersed? Most importantly though, there are a lot of different strategies we can take, including, as I mentioned to you, do we put in all the other standards? Do we take an AS9145? You know, and also very importantly, as you know, very near and dear to my heart. And I'll say this, it's a requirement of the standards of the high level structure that top management integrate in the requirements of AS9100 and 14,001 into the business processes of the organization. 
So I've been telling people, de facto, the standard is asking for integrated management systems. Of course, it's a great strategy because it saves money, it saves time, it saves auditing time. So a little preview of what's yet to come, Mike. All right. Well, Chad, thank you. Uh, that's uh, Chad Keimel, mm -hmm. CTO uh, and founder of Omnex and uh, the presenter at next week's uh, webinar on AS9100 uh, on Tuesday, okay. uh, uh, June 7th. So be sure if you're, if you're in aerospace mm -hmm. and are looking at uh, acquiring AS9100 or already have it, then you're going to want to tune into that webinar. Thanks, Chad. Thank you, guys. Take care. Okay, you too. Thanks, Chad. We'll see you on Tuesday. All right. Good, good stuff. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see Chad back again on, on Tuesday for that webinar, so make sure you check that one out. All right, well, we have a couple minutes before the show, and so I want to do a quick story for you that I found really interesting. Uh, it's called Mother of Modern Management, and it was written by Harish Jose, appeared in Tuesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Well, the woman he's talking about is Lillian Moeller Gilbreth, and, and she was, in all respects, an incredible person, and this article gives you a sense of, of, of who she was and what made her so unique. Well, where to start? Well, although she was also known as America's first lady of engineering, she was not educated as an engineer. As, in fact, she earned a master's degree in literature and her PhD in psychology, which she put to very good use, as it turns out, in her career. Early in the 20th century, her and her husband, Frank, uh, began looking at the concepts underpinning scientific management, also known as Taylorism. As a psychologist, she understood that time and motion studies uh, were great, but they only kind of went so far because there was no emotional investment from the worker, and, and attempts without that, attempts to improve efficiency, really would, would never stick. In other words, what she's saying is looking at Taylorism and the time and motion studies and scientific management, there was this idea that there was one single best way to do the job, but there really wasn't an ability for the worker to, to push back on that in any way and say, well, yeah, I have a suggestion to make it even better. That wasn't considered. Management looked at these time and motion studies, said, do it that way, and that was it. So without that emotional investment, a lot of that stuff didn't really work as well, but she and her husband, Frank, helped improve that with what was, became known as humanistic Taylorism. Well, later, when working for GE, she pioneered motion efficiency in the kitchen, actually, uh, and believing, as in the factory, that there was a single best way to do everything and that she would arrange her kitchens in such a way to, to be very, very efficient. The Gilbreths were also strong proponents of, of visuality, and they employed what we would now call perhaps a, a, a form of personal Kanban in their home. Uh, Joe's writes that her ideas fit in perfectly well with the Toyota production system developed decades later. I mean, think about all those things, visuality and, and efficiency and, and the emotional culture of asking workers their opinion and their questions. That's really TPS decades before it, TPS actually happened. Kind of interesting stuff. Well, uh, a couple of quick bullets on, on her before we, we, we cut the story. Uh, again, fascinating woman. She was member number one of the Society of Women Engineers, first member of that, of that organization. She and her husband, Frank, raised 12 children uh, in Montclair, New Jersey, not far from where I grew up. Uh, she was the mom in the Cheaper by the Dozen book. If you, if you ever saw that movie, yeah. the Steve Martin movie, well, that movie was a very bad adaptation, but two of her children wrote the book Cheaper by the Dozen in the 1940s, which was adapted to movies back then and then was remade in 1993 <laughs> oh, by funny. Steve Martin. So she was the mom in that book. Uh, fascinating woman. I mean, we, we like doing these little personal yeah. studies of people in, in engineering and, and quality that, that had special lives. And, and boy, what an amazing life. Um, you know, appointed by President Hoover on a commission, did, did a lot of amazing things in her life and, uh, and, and really was a trailblazer in, in, in a lot of ways. So, so yeah, well, Lillian well, Moeller Gilbert. Lillian, Lillian. Lillian Moeller, somebody Lillian I didn't Gilbert. know much about, really. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, and most people, you know, they hear about her husband, uh, Frank, uh, Frank, Gilbreth. Frank Gilbreth. Frank Gilbreth, yeah, yeah. but she was really, she had a lot of contributions to make on her own, and, and you know, she faced a lot of sexism, I mean, of course, yeah. in, oh, the, sure. in, <laughs> in the early part of the yeah. 20th century, a lot of sexism. There was one, I, I, this was an interesting story, there was one thing where she wrote a book that was a very well-known well book in the 1930s, and uh, her publisher convinced her to just put uh, L.M. Gilbreth on it not Lillian Mola Gilbreth. Okay. So she was invited to speak at an engineering conference. When they found out she was a woman, they turned her away. Wow. They didn't let her speak because she was a woman in the 1930s, <laughs> oh, even though man. she was the author of the book. You couldn't possibly know anything. They, well, yeah, L.M. <laughs> L. L. Gilbreth. Yeah. Nobody knew she was a woman, so oh, they invited wow. her to speak. She turns up and she's like, you're L.M. Gilbreth? I'm sorry, you can't come in. You can't speak to these engineers. Oh, it's all man. men. 
fascinating story. Wow. So wow. <laughs> check that one out by by uh, by Harry Shows. Uh, really good article. Again, right below the player page, right down there. All right. Well, that's the end of our show for today. So thanks to all of you for joining us. Also remember, as we pointed out, mm -hmm. if you're in aerospace, you're going to be interested in the upcoming webinar changes and implementation strategies for AS 9100D. That's the new revision of AS 9100 coming out in October-ish. Uh, that's going to be Tuesday, June 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific if you're interested. If you just click on the Chad Kaimo mm -hmm. AS9100 piece underneath the player page, go out there in that article at the very bottom is a link out to that web. Why don't we make it easier? The we should just put the link right underneath we, the player page. We do. Page. You're going to get an email on Monday. Again, <laughs> that will that will invite you to the webinar. So you just keep an eye on your email as well. That's an easy way to do it. There you go. Are you happy? <laughs> I'm happy. Good job. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. And, and again, thank you, uh, thank you, Chad, for joining us and giving us a little teaser on on the webinar coming up on Tuesday. So make sure you sign up for that one. All right. Well, that's our show. Thank you all for joining us as well. Um, we'll see you next week for another big week of Quality Digest Daily, and we'll be right back here on Friday, uh, June 10th. I think that'll be. Hopefully, we'll know that date by then. <laughs> we'll have uh, that, yeah. for, uh, for next Friday's Quality Digest Live. So come back and join us then. <laughs> See you later. So long. Bye.